Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Thank you, Kenny. Um, um, so, so I know we're not doing the feedback uh, questions, and I know some of you feel uh, some certain way. Here's what we can do, right? But it's going to require your participation, all right? And so if you don't participate, then, then I actually don't care, right, for next week. I don't care, because over the next three weeks, we're not taking feedback because um, of the panel. But here's what we're going to do. I just thought about it now. Is, uh, is Simpiwe, what he will do, uh, he hasn't agreed to it, <laughs> but at the end of the gathering at the Sabona table, um, if you're willing, can you go and just give your answer? He'll record it, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll post it on our stories, okay? So then uh, maybe later today or tomorrow, uh, we can get the feedback that way. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so you guys, are you guys going to, you guys sit here. I know you people. Yes, we will do it. We will. And then no one shows up. Okay, so let's, let's do that over the next three weeks, um, and, and hopefully we'll get some, some good feedback. The reason that we're not taking feedback um, is because is we're going to have a panel over these next three weeks. Uh, today we're talking singleness, uh, next week marriage, and then parenting. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do by the power of the Holy Spirit is, is every week to give you a short, uh, short, pray for me, pray for me, a short message up front um, before we bring the panelists uh, up, just to set the, 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 the tone, to give some context, to lay some foundation for every single thing that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks, uh, like we'll do this morning. Our, our new series is called Family Matters. Right now, there's, there's a lot of things that we can talk about uh, with regards to family. We are a family. God has called us uh, into this beautiful family, and there's a lot of things that exist within this family, and so there's lots to talk about. But, and so we've taken three, just three, even though there's many, many more, we've taken three. So singleness, marriage, and parenting. And the reason that we are talking about these things is because family matters, all right? So these family matters that we're going to be talking about, we're bringing them up because they matter. They matter to us as a family, and as you will see every week, that they matter to God. And so this week, we're going to kick it off uh, talking about singleness. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right, buckle up. See, singleness uh, is an interesting thing. Uh, many people have varying thoughts on it. And, and what I have experienced, and I don't speak for everyone, that's one of the things uh, that I, I want to be clear about. Listen, there's a lot of things that the Bible says. The Bible's very clear. That, that I, I speak Clearly, uh, in conviction, all of it. And then there's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't say, and so here I want to be careful. And that's the reason for the, the panel, is to bring to you uh, some, some different thoughts and some different rhythms. All right, so, so many people, they, they, they have different thoughts about singleness, but generally, all right, so generally, uh, the, the feeling is, is that most people love singleness. They think it's a great thing until you don't want it anymore. Is, is, that a, is that a fair kind of uh, assumption to make, right? We love singleness. We're okay to be single until we don't want to be single anymore. It, it can feel like freedom until it feels like a prison. A prison you would do anything to get out of. And so I just want to uh, say up front that there is a difference between singleness and unwanted singleness. There is a difference between singleness and unwanted singleness. And here I'm speaking to all the married folk in the room. I hope you're hearing me. I'm speaking on behalf of the singles, that there is a difference between singleness and unwanted singleness. Now, what I'm going to talk about, like, it, it matters and it's applicable for both. But, but you can be single and be happy in your singleness. Amen. And so stop asking folks who are happy in their singleness, so when are you going to start dating? When are you going to get better? No, leave me alone. I'm, I'm happy. I'm content in my singleness. This is what I want. And at the same time, there are folks in here who are navigating unwanted singleness. Unwanted singleness. And so when walking through unwanted singleness, we, we should be compelled to think more carefully about what, what the Bible teaches on, on, yes, marriage, on singleness, and disappointment in general. See, before going anywhere... We should go first to God's word. What does the counsel of God say to the person who desires a God-glorifying marriage? It is committed to finding a spouse with biblical wisdom and still marriage does not come. This, like many disappointments, 
It's a difficult journey to think about, let alone walk. I mean, I, I pray. I pray for everyone who finds themselves here. In fact, I should probably be praying more for God to answer your prayers, to bring to you or maybe for you to go and find a God-fearing, good-looking, amen? A God-fearing, good-looking spouse. And if, and if the Lord does not move in that direction for you, then I pray that he would give you all that you need to continue to trust and walk with him. Yeah. Now, before I bring up the panelists for today, uh, can we have a, a discussion? Can we, uh, just for a brief moment, unpack uh, three biblical categories to think through, especially for those who are navigating unwanted signals? Because remember, this is applicable for, for anyone who is single. But, 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 but three biblical categories that, that we can kind of hang on to as we make our way through this morning. And those three categories are a gift, a struggle, and a loss. That as we think about unwanted singleness, we should think a gift, a struggle, and a loss. You see, understanding the different dimensions of unwanted singleness, I believe, helps us identify how the Bible speaks to each one. And as always, God's word is sufficient. Amen. It is sufficient. It, it, it Amen. equips us for faithfulness. It, it, it equips us to persevere. It gives us everything that we need to be content. Yeah. And so let's jump in. Number one, a gift. Now, now the most well-known passage about singleness is, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verses 6 and 7. Really, the, the first part of that chapter speaks a lot about it, but, 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 but verse 6 and 7 talks about, about singleness as a gift. That's where many of us get it from. It's where Paul writes, I say this as a concession, as a point of argument. That's what he's saying. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am. But each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. And so Paul says, listen, I'm single. And so I just want to put it out there. I wish everybody was like me. But, but if not, that's totally fine because, because some have one gift and, and others have a, another gift. You see, in this text, he's referring to both marriage and singleness as a gift. One is not greater than the other. Yeah. One is not an upgrade. And then the other is like, well, you must be a certain... Uh, second-class citizen. He sees both as a gift from God. See, according to the Bible, the gift of singleness is an external circumstance, not an internal disposition. The, the word gift is mentioned one time in 1 Corinthians uh, verse seven, uh, chapter 7, and, and it is in the mention to, call, to the call of being single. We see it only once or the state of being married. Paul says uh, people either have the gift of marriage or the gift of singleness. Yeah. But hear me, both of them are a gift from God. Yeah. So if you are single, you currently possess that gift. Yeah. And if you are married, then you currently possess that gift. Both are gifts. Even when they, when they don't feel like it, they're gifts. And because they are from God, hear me, they are good gifts. Yeah. Amen. See, when a, when a good gift doesn't feel good, it's usually because of one of two things. One, you don't understand the gift. Yeah. Two, you're using it incorrectly. Yeah. Make sense? See, later in the, in the chapter, Paul points out some advantages of being single. He goes on to say, the unmarried person is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but the married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord so that she may be both but she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But the married woman is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. My good friend, Sam Albury, offers some helpful wisdom on this passage in a book that he wrote called The Seven Myths About Singleness. I'd encourage you to get it uh, if you have never read it. 
He, he says, Paul is not saying that singleness is spiritual and marriage is unspiritual. Nor is he saying that singleness is easy, but marriage is hard. No, the contrast is between complexity and simplicity. Married life is more complicated. Singleness is more straightforward. Now, this may be hard to hear, especially in the world we now live in where things are supposed to be fair. Because you hear that and you're like, but that's not fair. I'm single and, and my life is, is complicated, and it probably is. But, but in comparison to the married life, let's just be, let's just be honest. Yeah. Single folks, when you go home after a long day, if you stay alone, then you go home to be alone by yourself in your own thoughts. You can, you can just rest. In fact, you probably don't have to think about what we're going to eat. You just go straight to bed. But for married folks... No, I'm going to leave it there because now Oaks, people are going to be like, mm, I wonder what's going on in the Makatle household. No, my, my home is great. I come home, it's amazing. S singleness and, and, and marriage are different. Now, different doesn't mean better. D different doesn't mean better. Unless we're talking about how, how you should cook your steak. Because anything above medium, then, then that's, no, that, that kind of difference is bad. Okay, but, but, but in relation to, to singleness and, and marriage, different doesn't mean better. Paul, Paul recognizes that single people do not have the built-in complexity that married people do and are generally free in their unique, less complex lives to engage in the things of the Lord in a unique, focused way. That's what he's saying. Be because there is, there is often so much baggage surrounding the term, the gift of singleness. It might be helpful to see how a biblical definition realigns some common broken ways of misunderstanding this. And so here, here are a few things that singleness is not. Singleness is not permanent. Be because the gift of singleness is simply our current situation, that means that it can change. If a single person desires to get married, it's not, it's not wrong to date or to pursue. Paul encourages those who desire to get married to get married. And the Bible holds a strong view of marriage. It does. And, and, and yes, while marriage can and often is idolized, especially in the church, those, those who want to get married, they, I want you to know that you desire something good something that God created, something that God instituted. Whether or not a person gets married, this is ultimately in the Lord's hands. You've got to know that. But singleness, just like marriage, is temporary. And so married folks, I need you to know that your marriage is not, is not eternal. Yeah. And when you die, or if Jesus comes back, then that's when your marriage comes to an end. Why? And we'll talk about this next week. It's because it's meant to be a picture of something greater. Yeah. Here's another one. Singleness is not our Lord. Having the gift of singleness does not mean that a single person should be consumed with ministry. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, your, your, your life is less complex and, and, and you have more opportunities to do things, but it doesn't mean that the only thing that you should do is ministry. Singles should, should use their calling and, and their flexibility for kingdom expanding, but also they should deeply enjoy life to the glory of God. Amen. Third one, singleness is not a spiritual gift. Yeah. <laughs> but Oni, you said it's a gift. I did. But it's not a spiritual gift. There is a difference. Lifelong singleness or, or a season of it is, is not a spiritual gift to be exercised but simply a circumstance in which to be faithful to God in. Sure. It's not a spiritual gift. Married, married folks and single folks have access to the same spiritual gifts, which are given by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jane Clark says this. She says, spiritual gifts are meant to build up the body of Christ. Obviously, singles are to strengthen the church too, but not by virtue of being single. Rather, singles do it by exercising their spiritual gifts just like everyone else. 
Your singleness isn't a spiritual gift then, but it is a gift from God. One he wants you to receive and enjoy with thanksgiving. If you're single, your singleness is a gift. If you're married, your marriage is a gift. If your marital status changes, God has given you a different situation within which to follow him. That's what it means. Single people should be using their spiritual gifts while they are unmarried, knowing that if God chooses to provide a spouse for them, that they will continue using those same gifts just in a different context. So singleness is a gift. That's category number one. Category number two, and these will go a lot quicker. We should think about unwanted singleness as a struggle. As a struggle. While unwanted singleness can can be painful, it's important to know that this pain is temporary. It is a temporary trial. And and, and the, the muscle needed to walk through unwanted singleness is the same muscle needed to walk through any unwanted trial. It is the muscle of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. See, the, the, the thing hoped for and not seen here is not marriage. Don't, don't, don't use it in that context. The, the verse is talking about all of God's promises to those who believe and trust in Him. God has not promised us marriage. I need you to know that. Or always happy circumstances. Or, or many other things that, that you may, may want. No, that's... So what he's promised you, if he gives it to you, then wow, that's amazing. That's just part of his goodness for you. But what he has promised us is, is, is infinitely more glorious. It's the forgiveness of sin. It's fellowship with him. It's an eternal place in his family. A role to play in the growth of that family. Sustaining and comfort in every trial. It's an inheritance in heaven that is unfading and imperishable. It's It's a day when tears and sorrow will be gone. And it's the absolute confidence that we will not be disappointed when our lives come to an end. Those are the promises that we hold on to. And so whatever trial or challenge or struggle we are going through, is, it's not essentially about the trial. It's about us and God. It's, it's us asking the question, do we trust Him? Do we believe in His Word? Are we living for His kingdom or are we living for our own? See, instead of focusing only on Paul's words about singleness, to gather deeper wisdom on the issue, I, I think we must also look at the entire Bible. And it tells us that that we are called to be faithful. To put one foot in front of the other every day in faith, in obedience to the good shepherd. Whether you're single or whether you're married. It's about daily walking with Jesus. See, these these concepts take up they take up much more space in our Bibles than the topic on singleness and marriage. And, and because it is a struggle, and the reason I, I, I want to paint this word struggle and I want to put it in front of you is, is, is we've, we've got to be honest about the struggle. There's too many of us that are like, you know what, unwanted singleness, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to share it. It's going to eat you up. But like any other struggle, when you share it, when you are vulnerable, when you are transparent, not only does it help you, but it helps those around you. Because all of us struggle. It may not be with singleness, but we struggle with something else. And so, and so when you open up about it and you're like, listen, I'm really struggling with this because I want to keep my eyes on Jesus. Will you help me? Other folks will go, oh, wow, we're allowed to share our struggles. We're allowed to be vulnerable. Why? Because, because we're all pointing one another to Jesus. Do you know what is courageous? What is, I think in our time, one of the most courageous things to do is to confess. You have no idea how powerful confession is. To just say, hey, I need help. I'm struggling. I'm wrestling with this. Friends, we can miss out on mutual ministry among believers. Opportunities to help others see in, in, in that whatever trial we, we are going through, we can continue to trust God. 
The married and the unmarried can find common ground through shared transparency and vulnerability. I'm telling you, being married almost 15 years in, it, it doesn't solve everything. I still need you. Single folks, I, I said, we still need you. <laughs> Finally, unwanted singleness is, is not just a situation to leverage or, or hardship to be endured faithfully. It is also, here's the third category, it's a loss worth grieving before the Lord. It's a loss worth grieving before the Lord. You see, when, when we recognize the trial of unwanted singleness and lay it before Jesus, this, I believe, allows us to grieve the sense of loss that sits in. Having said that, the, the Bible does show us how to respond to losses in our lives. To use biblical language to lament before the Lord. There is a loss. I spoke about confession just now, but, 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 but it's just being honest that there is a loss. There's a, there's a loss of, of, of this dream that, that, I, that, that I, I want to be married. There's a loss of, of this dream of, of, of starting a family. There is a loss. And so we lament before the Lord. And, and friends, lamenting is everywhere in the Scriptures. I know as the church, we often don't talk about lamenting, but it is everywhere in the Scriptures. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible to not lament when living in a broken world. To never lament is to lie to oneself. It's, it's to not be honest with yourself. And hear me, lament is not about sitting in a pool of self-pity or despair. It's not about sitting in a, in a pool of, of depression and going, what was me, look at my own... No, that's not what lamenting is. It's about being honest with God. When he's, when he's good character and our, our painful circumstances don't make sense. It's when they collide and I'm going, this doesn't make sense. But God, I thought you were good and he is good. But you're like, but why am I in this situation? Why am I navigating through this unwanted singleness? It involves turning to God, bringing our frustrations to him, asking him for help and choosing to trust him. Friends, to, to cry is human. To lament is Christian. M Mark, uh, they pronounce it ro-gob. But here in South Africa, we, we would say, what, frohop? Is that, is that, I, I don't know if it's up on the screen. But he, he wrote a book called Dark Clouds, um, Deep Mercy. And he says this. He says, the, the practice of lament, the kind that is biblical, honest and redemptive it is not as natural for us because every lament is a prayer, a statement of faith. Lament is the honest cry of a heart, hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. That's what it means to Lament. And it's everywhere. King, I mean, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes says that there's a time to weep. Yeah. The Lord himself wept. The, the Psalms and, and prophets are full of laments. The, the Bible, hear me, the Bible gives us permission to weep deeply, to, to have that ugly cry over the life we hoped we would have and not feel ashamed of what we hoped for. There is no shame, hear me, there is no shame to say, I'm, I'm hoping, I hoped for a marriage, I hoped for a family, and yet it's not happening. Lament. We should allow ourselves to lament the loss that comes with unwanted singleness. L lament is, is the way God has, has, designed, has designed us to, to process pain. To lament is to live in reality. And hear this, lamenting can... Lamenting can awaken us to the reality of sin. That's what it can do. So don't fear it. Don't deny it. Don't turn away from it. Grieve the loss. Lament. Because lamenting can awaken us to the reality of sin. It can uncover some things that are in your heart. What's, what's, what's really motivating you? 
Why do you long for that? What's going on there? Is, is it because you, you, you love God and you believe in Him or, or are you hoping that it will fill something that only He can fill? Lamenting can awaken us to the reality of sin, suffering, loss, and pain. And, hear me, and also awaken us to the gospel. It can awaken us to the gospel, to hope, to redemption, and to our heavenly reality. And so if you are single and don't want to be, hear me, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. God is not overlooking you or ignoring you. He is purposely giving you something. I don't know for how long, but he is purposely giving you something. He's giving you a gift. And there is a struggle. And there is a a loss. And I want you to recognize those things. I want you to have them in your hands and recognize them. But it doesn't end there. Because you've got to take your hands, your eyes off what's in your hands so that you might see whose hands you are in. You're in God's hands. And so in closing, and as I call up the panelists, we should be faithful to everything that God has placed in our hands. We respond faithfully to the gift of unwanted singleness when we use our single years for strategic kingdom service. We respond faithfully to the hardship of unwanted singleness when we endure with patience and trustworthiness, opening up to the family of faith who also have trials of various kinds. We respond faithfully to the, to the loss of, of, of unwanted singleness when when we don't ignore it, but rather lament it and allow it to awaken in us the wonder of God. We should, as always, respond to the gospel in utter surrender. And so I'm going to call up our three panelists. Uh, Please feel free to come up. Uh, Elder Kenny, do you mind grabbing those chairs and just putting them up here for our folks? Um, and so what we did is we asked you guys last week to, to send us some questions uh, that we can navigate through. Just, if you put them on the carpet, that'd be great. There we go. And then one on the other side. Thank you. If you can put it on the, closer to the carpet. Uh, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit here. Is that cool? All right, great. Um, let me grab some mics for you guys. Production, I hope I don't destroy anything, yeah. Grab that. Here we go. Oh, no, this way. So we asked you guys to submit some questions, um, which many of you did uh, through various platforms, um, whether it's your family group, if you're in one. If you're not in one, I encourage you to get into a family group. It's it's incredible. Uh, Some of you, there we go, thank you. Uh, Some of you uh, submitted questions uh, on, the, uh, on the Instagram story, so very thankful, and then some of you submitted them last week Sunday in the box, which you can do uh, this week for next week's one on marriage, and so we're just going to kind of walk through some of these, uh, some of them, uh, you know, they, they came up with, the panelists here, um, and we'll try to get to, through as many of them as we can, um, and just kind of see what the Lord does. Now, sitting uh, beside me, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with all these folks here. Uh, to my right, I'll start here. Uh, it's your favorite, uh, my beloved, uh, my wife, co- Confidence. Um, and uh, she, uh, I mean, she's no real reason to say why she's up here, uh, but I'll do it anyway. Um, she, she has navigated uh, with uh, so many women throughout the years uh, in different stages of their lives. Um, and I've, I've just watched that, and many of you have seen that, and it's been absolutely incredible. She also uh, oversees the women's discipleship here at Rooted Fellowship, and in many ways uh, started that with a, a great team of women. Um, and so if you've experienced any form of discipleship here at Rooted Fellowship, uh, man, we, we give thanks for what God has done in and through her. Um, and then uh, I'll go over there. It's Balesa. Uh, Balesa has been at Rooted for many years. Uh, she is an engineer. <laughs> Shout out. Um, and uh, serves in just various uh, ministry departments here at Rooted Fellowships. You hear a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, currently uh, single and, and navigating through it. Um, and I believe doing so uh, as faithful as she can as she keeps her eyes on Jesus. Uh, and then to my 
left, we have uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen uh, is not single. Just want to put that out there. Um, but but uh, the reason that he is here is uh, was single for a very long time. Um, and uh, I, when we met, he was, he was single and, um, and, and navigated that journey. Um, only got married much later in, in life, but I believe uh, as I watched him navigate, his singleness did it in, incredibly, incredibly well. Um, did all the things that I just mentioned here. Stephen uh, has been at Rooted uh, since the very beginning, uh, serves as an elder, but is currently on sabbatical. He's married to uh, Jessica. I was trying to figure out if I should say surnames, but you never know what people might Google stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so having said that, let's jump straight in uh, to these questions. And uh, yeah, let's just answer them. So he, here's one. It's a little bit connected to maybe next week's, um, uh, next week's topic, but, but I think we can address it here. Uh, and it was asked in the context of singleness. But here's the question. Is it biblical to believe that God has someone specific for you? in terms of marriage, or do we have the liberty to choose uh, within the confines of Christianity? So this person acknowledges that there is a Christian way uh, to, to choose, but the, has God specifically uh, you know, provided someone or has someone in plan, or is there a liberty to choose? Any, any thoughts on that one? Go. Stephen, you oh. take that one. Shall I, shall I start? Okay, I, I think no. I don't think there's a, the one. Um, yeah, partly because I don't think the Bible says there's, there's a one. Um, and I think we're free to choose. Um, even 1 Corinthians 7 that, that you read. First, sorry, hi, everyone. <laughs> Let me just say hi. But it was a very much a yes-no question. So, <laughs> so uh, I got baited into, into that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think it can be a bit unhelpful. To think that there's a one, it can it can sort of feel like you've got to find them like find, searching for a needle in a haystack. Uh, also, I think if you do get married and then it turns out to be hard, it, it could be like, hmm, maybe I was wrong and this wasn't the one, <laughs> and uh, and that's not that is not true. <laughs> um, so yeah, I I think uh, I think people are free to make wise choices, wise and biblical choices, um, and not that there's one person who is in the entire world who is set out for you. But I think it kind of gets back to almost predestination questions because looking back, you can see God's hand yep. in providing. But, but looking forward, I don't think it's like you have to be searching for the one and, and, and desperately hoping that you're picking the right one. Yeah. I think you can make a decision and take responsibility for that decision when you get married uh, to fulfill your promises. And, and, uh, and then looking back, you'll understand that you'll give God all the glory for providing you with, with a gift of marriage and of a spouse. It's really good. But I don't think up front it should be like there's only one person yeah. out there. It's good. I love it. Any other thoughts? Oh. I, I, like, I like how you said it in terms of the predestination thing. Um, I would, just in summary of what you said is, is to say there isn't, I agree, there isn't the one until you say I do. Then it's the one. Right, the Bible's very clear about that, like the, the intentions of God's design and, and how he creates marriage, and, um, and yet still so much grace for, for when things don't always go the way that we desire, but there isn't the one, and so there's freedom there uh, within the confines of Christianity and, and Bibli- what the Bible says, um, but when you say I do, then, then that, that person that you say I do to is the one. Uh, very good. Um, yep. I think it's on. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm not going to add... Uh, thanks, Stephen. I think what I wanted to just highlight is the second part where they say, do we have liberty to choose within the confines of Christianity? Um, I think that's very important. Um, I think the longer, well, in my experience being around women, I mean, I, I usually feel bad speaking about this topic because I have been, um, I've only been single half of my life, but the rest of the half I've been married. So um, some of the struggles really have not been direct for me, has been just experiencing people close, people I care for. Um, going through uh, that struggle of unwanted singleness. But I think as the years go, the temptation to date outside of the confines of Christianity becomes a very real thing uh, that gets entertained often. Um, Understandably so, because it starts feeling like, but at least I'll get one, two, three, four, at least. So I think having the obedience and the perseverance and the faith and the trust in God to still stick to God's design, God's um, command and what he wants you to do and staying in community, all of the above is just very important because the same way where people get desperate, we've also known people 
that have gone ahead and done that, and it has not ended well. Uh, and the experience of this gift called marriage has not been what uh, you would want for that person. So I just wanted to add that. That's good. I think maybe let me jump into the next question in light of that. Um, so here's a question in, in light of First Corinthians chapter seven, verse thirty-four. Uh, where you know Paul talks about, um, hey, if if you're single, then you can be focused on uh, the things of the Lord. But if you're married, then you, you can't. And, and what does that, all of that mean? But so theologically and practically, what does it look like for a, a single woman um, to to be concerned about the things of God? And how how best should a single woman? So I know it's very applicable to both men and women, but this question is specifically for women. Uh, how, how best should a single woman live uh, a holy life in both body and and spirit? Melissa. Yes, ma'am. Hello. <laughs> um, theologically, I think, because the whole chapter is about that the attentions are undivided, so you do have undivided money, undivided time, and so you have more of it because it's undivided. Mm -hmm. And I think you have that extra time and extra money, like extra time to spend growing in your faith, which is something we don't talk about, extra time to point to people's lives, and extra money to give, <laughs> which is a difficult one. Um, and when I was thinking about it practically, I was inclined to think about this doesn't mean this, because there's obviously an inclination from married people to try put everything on single people. But I think that also comes from the world's thing of prioritize yourself, which is not a biblical thing. Um, and so I thought to myself, why not? Why not do more? I think our inclination should be to do more rather than less, and God is so gracious when we do more and try to please him, in that we find satisfaction. Whereas when we try to do the different thing, like to please ourselves, we find ourselves dissatisfied. Sure. So practically speaking, for me, it's meant like, obviously, sorry to say obviously, it's my favorite word. Um, it's meant serving at church, um, serving in ministries, being willing to step in when people can't do on a particular day, and the time and the money is also not just for church. And obviously church, but not, because maybe you could feel like, oh, I can only minister church, but you can also be open to finding things, like places to serve outside of church. Like for me, a big thing is that people should read the Bible and they should learn how to read the Bible for themselves and they should mm -hmm. read through the Bible. And so like having studies with women, like my family, we have a Bible study other women to learn how to read the Bible and to read through the Bible and having like Bible reading marathons. That's been a big thing for me. And also you guys know my many kids, <laughs> like I spend Sundays with them and I'm teaching them the catechism because I'm like, I want them to have a framework through which to understand the world in a true way. So, yeah. It's good. It's really, really good. Any other thoughts on that before I move on? That was really, really, really good. And, and, and Belissa, I just want to commend you because I, I and many others uh, have seen that, have seen how you um, make the most of the season uh, that you're in, uh, this gift of singleness, and, and this church benefits tremendously from it. Um, and so thank you, uh, and many others who, who do likewise. Um, Stephen, Stephen, this one might be for you a little bit, but again, open to everyone here on the panel. Um, someone asks, I'm, I'm a single person in my early 40s. Should the church feel relieved for me because marriage is hard and thus I've dodged a bullet? <laughs> it's, I'm, just, I'm just reading the question. Um, or, or should the church feel sad for me? Um, have, I, have I missed on God's design and, and gift? I'm assuming here they're talking about marriage. Um, any, yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think neither. So both marriage and singleness are great gifts. And the, what the world will do is sell us a narrative that there's something wrong with both of them. Mm. It, depending on the situation you're in, the devil might want to tempt you one way or the other. And uh, they're both really good gifts. So no, you haven't dodged a bullet <laughs> to by avoiding marriage. Yes, marriage can be hard at times, but it's a great gift. It's a great gift. Um, uh, but also, we shouldn't feel sorry for you. We shouldn't mm. feel sad like, I mean, uh, you did make good points about to some extent there's a loss. There's maybe particular dreams you, you, mm. that you, you realize aren't going to work out the way you had, you had hoped and dreamed. So I acknowledge that. But it's not a second-rate situation. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not something that like, we should just feel sad and sorry for people who, who are single. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, I think we do, we do need to have a, a high view of singleness, just as we need to have a high view of marriage. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe two caveats uh, before I say too much more that I've, I felt like I needed to say, um, because I do have quite a high view of, of singleness. And, and, and I think that's because I, I was single until I was 38. Um, so if you can do maths, you, you, you can realize I'm older than 38. Um, <laughs> but um, but, but uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I thought quite long and hard about this and, 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 and I have a high view of singleness. Uh, but I, so I need to caveat and say I love my wife very much and I'm happily married. Um, so when I speak positively of singleness, it's in no way to the detriment of <laughs> the great gift of marriage. Uh, and the other thing to say that I, that I realized with the, the sharpening uh, effect of my, my wife's feedback through chatting to her yesterday, that I also want to acknowledge that my experience of singleness um, may not be the same as everyone else's. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, and the struggles are slightly different for everyone. Um, and, and people's singleness happens at different times in their lives and for different reasons. And, and I do acknowledge that. And I, and I, and I don't want my uh, calling us to a high view of singleness to, to be seen as sort of not sympathetic for, for some very real struggles that, that are out there. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I felt like that, that needs to be said. But the, the, have I forgotten the thrust of the actual question? No, no. It's was? Fine. What was the question again? Just remind me. Dodge the bullet. Dodge the bullet. Yeah. So no, you haven't dodged the bullet. Um, it's a good thing we need to have we need to have a high high view of it. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll say I'll say more later. But for now, yeah. definitely definitely neither. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Stephen. Um, I was actually thinking about it as well. That. Um, I think when you get a question like that, um, it always, let me not say it's always, but I think in my experience that of uh, being around other women, at least in their 40s, um, that it just hits uh, differently. Mm. Um, like you are, you know, in your 30s, hope is different versus in your 40s versus in your 50s. So it's, um, you can even hear the tone of the question is uh, like as if this is it. This is my reality forever. Like, mm. okay, that means now I'm meant for singleness forever, or I'm, yeah, like I'm never gonna get married. So I think as the years go on, there's a, just a dwindling hope, um, which there shouldn't be, but you know, it's a struggle nonetheless. Mm. What I wanted to ask though, Stephen, just um, um, if you would like to answer that question, uh, is that um, how, so I, th I think for a woman, we generally have to wait culturally, not that we have to because the Bible says so, but we wait. To be pursued, initiate like somebody has to come and ask you to mm -hmm. uh, ask you to be to marry you, ask to marry you, where the man does the initiation, and so at any point, a man at any age can make the decision to marry a woman. Mm -hmm. So it just really puts us, uh, well, puts women and men in different places. Mm -hmm. So I want to just ask if you're willing to share, like, what was your reason for staying unmarried till that age? Uh, till, yeah, till that age. <laughs> Other than you didn't find the one, because you only found the one at the yeah. and we so, all know that. So. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. Um, and I have many thoughts that go through my mind. Uh, one is that I think sometimes the categories of wanted and unwanted singleness are a little bit more blurred than that, in that I think I, I strived to be content in singleness, but it wasn't always easy. Um, that's the, the first thing. So, so it's not like it was either wanted or unwanted singleness entirely. Like it, you navigate every day and every season. Um, and even when you're striving to be content, it doesn't mean you don't have desires for, for companionship, for sex, etc. You have those issues. Um, and I had, uh, I had, twice I did pursue someone in my life and it didn't work out. And it humbled me. It was so. It was. I think my answer to the question of the day was, Umjolo taught me to. It taught me brokenness and and humility. Mm. It taught it 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 wrecked my my sort of squeaky clean sure. record. Sure. Um, it it showed I have I have some problems. I have. It's difficult. I struggle to make certain decisions. So it wasn't easy. Um, it wasn't quite as simple as just the sort of like I'm I'm just staying single forever because I want it or, yeah. Um, but it was also that I didn't I didn't force the issue right like, mm. um, and I, 
yeah, and then obviously, and there was no guarantee that there would always be that there would be a, a marriage would be on the table later. I'm very grateful that uh, I I was able to get married and I, and I and I love my wife very much. So um, I'm grateful for that. But I know that's not a sort of a promise on the table. Yeah. So th those are some of the various thoughts. But but um, but even yeah, maybe it links to some of the unhelpful questions that sometimes people ask. Is there's also some sort of an assumption that. Uh, what's wrong with someone? Why aren't they married? Or why, well, this is a really nice person. Why isn't? Why isn't? Why aren't they married? Or mm. I think that can also be a, a problematic thing to ask. And um, and uh, yeah. And then also you, you you rightly point out. I think that sometimes the experience is a bit different for for guys and girls. And that's also why I wanted to acknowledge that my struggles were maybe slightly different at times um, to to how it is for, for for girls and for for people at different ages as well. Mm. It's great. I'd like to add something. Yes, ma'am. Um, in terms of how, I guess, how the church should respond, I think a lot of times we encourage each other with unbiblical things. So the whole thing mm. of if you say, I'm struggling with singleness, and somebody says, well, marriage is difficult. Yes, two things can both be difficult, mm. and we don't need to have a comparison between the two, good. and you can sit in someone's difficulty with them. So, so I think that. That's so good. So, so good. Um, thanks for sharing that. Mm. Maybe just on that, but I said because you you've kind of alluded a little bit to it. Um, you know, people are hearing this, and 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 you you made the distinction between singles and and those who are married. It, there's definitely things that um, we say to one another that are unhelpful. Um, even though we we may even walk away from this and going, man, I, I want to really do better. I want to love and serve our, our single folks here at Rooted better. Um, and so I guess my, my question is just so that people can be aware, uh, what, what are some, some unhelpful things um, that, uh, that people have said? What, what kind of comments, possibly awkward ones, have, have you gotten about your single status from people who, who may be well-meaning um, but don't always know what to say? Um, I think, again, the fact that it's unbiblical things that people are saying. So we should use the Bible to encourage each other because we have the word. So one of the things that, um, I think when I think of the root of the questions, is the fact like that people are trying to find a reason for people's singleness. And the Bible doesn't give a reason for people's singleness. It tells us that everything that happens is for the good of God's people and his glory, and we shouldn't overstep that. So one of the things is when people say, you're single so that like you can be more content. And that's unbiblical because Firstly, before I go to the biblicalness of it, we know discontented married people, yeah. and they are content single people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just even from a survey, it's untrue. But it's also making it seem like the good, God, the good gift that God has given has been earned by the married person, by being content. And God gives gifts as he sees fit, yeah. and he allots them, and we don't have to be looking into that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first one. And another one, just to say that I'm also not saying that people, we shouldn't be looking to get wisdom from other people. But another one is that I've heard is you're too picky, which hmm. the only way to see if somebody's picky, because I'm just to say, like when you ask somebody what they would like, right, you are asking for their best, right? Like what are they looking for? So obviously that person is going to give you what they are looking for. And we ask God for that. But I think that's different to if I said I want A, B, C, D, E, and I'm unwilling to compromise on things that are compromisable. So the only way you can see if somebody's picky is if they've gotten options and they've kept on saying no to good, valid options. Mm. So. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go preach. Um. Um. Do you have one? No, no, go for Awkward it. things. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I, oh, I don't know if I said that, but I really love women, and I love the fact that God has made us women, and um, the, the role that we play, who we are, it's just, just God's design. The mm. very same way that I love men. It's very different, but... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, very different. Um, but what I wanted to say is, obviously, I'm around women, and I love to hear what they think, and I think one of the awkward things that I've heard, and... I mean, maybe I could have also entertained it, um, is this whole thing of like, yeah, but if this girl maybe 
I don't know, like did one dressed a little bit better or maybe lost a bit of weight or did, I feel like those things are so unfair. Mm. Like, and I think they are usually pointed at women generally. It's like they need to do something about their appearance and apparently they're gonna do those things and suddenly get a husband. I, I don't know, like I don't know if those things are correlated. I mean, so obviously I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of ourselves. I think that is a general, command to all of us, men, women, married, unmarried, you need to take care of yourself, you know, like, so that's not a taking away that part. But this thing where there's a laser, like if they did one, two, three, four, that would maybe somehow land that person a spouse. I mm. think that is a very unfair thing to say. And I think I heard, I'm not gonna say her name because I think a lot of people know her, but um, uh, she's a celebrity and she said, um, you know, we talk about those things and yet, God, you could be showing up in the morning looking as scruffy as I don't know what, and then God can still give you a husband. Like, it's not really about all those things. Because as we're saying, it is a gift. So it's actually not really up to you. But I'm not saying not make an effort, go on dates, whatever. But I'm trying to say is that I think the pressure that we can often put on people to look a certain way and do certain things with the hope that after they've done all those things, they're going to have a partner is not helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's really good. Um, and maybe this, and this one's for everyone, so please jump in here. Um, just again, in light of that, is there, is there anything you would say to married folks who, who want to be more intentional? So we've heard like what not to do, right? But now, okay, wh what can we do to be more intentional in our love and service to, to people who are single, um, whether it's their decision or not? Are there some practical things that, that you would say, hey, I wish, I, wish, I wish married folks would do this, you know, it'd be super helpful, not just to, in the pursuit of finding someone, but, but just, you know, in, in helping me navigate this life that I'm living as I pursue Jesus. Hello again. Um, I think, so I had a struggle with making friends at the beginning of the year, and my friend said to me that people don't owe you friendship, and that is fair, difficult, but fair, but what we do owe each other is care. Mm. And so in a family group setting, if you, I don't think people should only check up on their friends, even though that's easy. And it cannot also be a Thursday thing, like we meet on Thursdays. You can't only be following up on me on a Thursday because life could be going really well on Thursday and be really terrible on a Tuesday. So we need to be caring for each other. We need to be checking up on each other. And I think another thing is we are told to rejoice with each other and to also mourn with those who mourn. And I think we need to learn to sit in difficulty with each other. Like I mentioned a bit about it, but like when somebody is lonely, sit and don't try to solve it. Like we need to learn to sit there. But that's also not to say everyone experiences loneliness. So I'm also not saying that. Um, and yeah, that's part of caring for each other. Mm. Any other thoughts? Maybe, Stephen, what was helpful um, in those years where you were single and, um, and, and married folks did, or you wish that married folks did? Yeah, I enjoyed um, some of my married friends. I enjoyed hanging out with them. Um, I think married folk can hang out with single folk without any f weird worries about is there is it a third wheel. Um, on both sides, I, I, single people don't be scared of hanging out with a married couple, of going away for a weekend with them. And married folk don't also be, be scared that it's going to be awkward. Just hang out. And, and I, I have a few, yeah, I had a few married friends who, who were great at that. Mm. Um, and it was really good friendships. Mm. Um, yeah, so let's try and break that thing off. It's married people hang out with married people and singles hang out with singles um, only. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah. It's good. Is, it, is there anything that maybe we, we've done and or we've seen? Um. I mean, I think, I think it's a very, for me, I think it's a very, I, I said that at the beginning already, it's a very personal topic, even if it's not mine personally, I think just having close, very close people who are in um, kind of the season we're talking about. And so it's, it's people I've cried with, uh, prayed with, and, and I think, um, one of the things is that we, I mean, I have a friend, I think you, you all figure it out, but uh, she'll just like show up at our house and um, she's very comfortable and she knows her way around my house and kids and stuff. And so it's, she's single. I mean, she would want the very same things, but I think she doesn't make it awkward. She shows up and she's like, you're family. Uh, you're my, you're my, we're family. We're mm -hmm. actually really family, not just because we're friends, but we are family. And so obviously this is not a now every, 
you know, like any random single person comes to your house and they're like, we're family, you know. <laughs> Obviously, it's not that kind of thing. You build relationship and you are, um, and I think with family group, the fact that you're seeing people every single week, like there should be some relationship there that allows some proximity. And, um, and I was even, I mean, we could be discussing this next week already, but I think uh, one of the things I was saying, I was like, the same way we should be opening up it's the, mm. it's, the, it's the same way around. Like, I think you should be offering as well. That's you know, uh, I think it's going to come up with parenting. It's like, uh, married people are also like, you, you're going to give me an hour? Two hours? We can quickly go have a date or have coffee and you can be with my kids. That way you're around our kids and you're part of the family. The same way um, meals and all those things shouldn't be just for married people. It's like, or parents. It's like, it's like if a single person is not well, mm. we should also be doing a roster for the single person to get meals. Like. Um, I think that is a way of, um, I don't know, helping one another, like serving yeah. one another, so. Yeah, yeah, I like to be, being around one another is, is, is massive. I, look, I learned a lot about marriage and parenting from books and, and talks and, and all sorts of things, podcasts, all of that. Um, but I would say the most influential um, learning moments was just being around married people as a single person and being around families, you know, folks who had kids as a single person. I remember just like offering up to babysit um, a family who had four boys, and, and, and it, it was tough, I won't lie, it was tough, um, but it was really, really good. Like, I got to see how they interact with one another as, as married folks and how they interact with their kids, and there's a lot of that stuff that I was like, ooh, that was good, that was good. And then there's a lot of stuff that's like, mm, not helpful, I'm not going to take that one, I'm going to leave that one alone. Um, so, so there is freedom to do that, but, but it's being in one another's spaces, and when you are in one another's spaces, to not always bring up their singleness. To not always bring up dating. To not have you noticed this? Up, no, just like, hey, what are your dreams? What are you like? Well, how's work and what's going on here? Who's your one more? Like asking questions that you would normally ask married folks, I think is is helpful. Um, so that's that's really cool. Um, let me ask this one. This is a uh, it's a good one. Um, what is the Bible's uh, position or and, and our church's position uh, on singleness and adoption? All right. So basically, if I'm single. And, and I want to adopt, what's, what's our position on that? What does the Bible say? And then here's the second part. And, and pursuing having children via other means, so other than adoption, uh, means like artificial uh, insemination. Um, and so just real quick, if you, I'm not a, uh, a doctor by any means, but artificial insemination is where uh, they take a male sperm and directly insert it into the female cervix or uterus. Um, in the hopes of increasing uh, the chances of pregnancy. Okay, so, but now I'm not speaking on, as married folks, it's married people that, that try to do that, to try to increase the chances of pregnancy, but this question is about uh, single people. Like, if I'm single and I want to do this, is what's the Bible's position? Um, and, but the first one is, is uh, kind of what is, what is the position on adoption? Um, let, let me go ahead and, and, and give some positions, uh, and then we can dialogue a little bit. So, uh, with regards to adoption, um, uh, I like to think of it this way. Um, God has a, a, a design. Um, he, he, he lays it out in, in Genesis. Of here's, here's how I, I am looking to have families multiply and grow and, and, and fill the earth. Right? He's very clear about it. We also see in Genesis 3 that sin steps in, uh, onto the scene and it, it breaks that design. Right? So what was God's design? One man, one woman uh, in covenant with one another and then be fruitful. But then we, we do realize that the brokenness hits the scene and, and, and it changes things. And, and so what does that mean for us today? Well, it means that as Christians and as the church, we are always moving towards God's design, not away from it. Even in trying to solve some of the issues that we face here today, we're always moving towards God's design and not from it. And so uh, with regards to adoption, what has happened in adoption is a child is already born, like there's, a child exists. There, there's someone in front of us who is made in the image of God, uh, but does not have a home. And so as we move towards God's design, because God's design is to have a home, is to have a family, is to be brought up in the context of a family. And so our position as we look in the scriptures, also because if you think about what they call the quartet of the vulnerable, right, the four groups of the vulnerable in the Old Testament, those four are the poor, uh, the foreigner, the widow, and the old Often, all right, and so God's command is for us as the people of God to move towards a redemptive family, and so we care for the orphan. And so, because of that, we then say, Yeah, well, if you're a single uh, person, then, then as you move towards that, you can adopt. If there's someone in front of you made in the image of God who is in need of a home, uh, then our, our job is to engage 
Now, I also want to say that because you're single, it does make it challenging like it would for any single parent. I grew up uh, the majority of my life in a single home, single parent. My father passed away, and, and it was difficult. It was difficult for my mom. My mom would say it. Um, and that's why, again, it's the, the, the importance of us as a community. So, even, so it's difficult for, for married folks to adopt, and there's some who've done that, and, and they share it. But they're so thankful for the community. There's single people in here who've also adopted. And we praise God for you. And they've also leaned into community because it is difficult. And so again, I want to stress the importance of doing this, this adoption in the context, married or single, in the context of community. Now, artificial insemination. I believe that that is moving away from God's design. Remember, one man, one woman. So in this scenario, there is no man or the man is a stranger. I have not entered into a covenant with him. And so I'm moving away from that design in trying to create this family. Whenever we do that, not just about this, but in anything in life, when we try to move away from God's design, hoping to solve some of the issues of the world, things don't end well for us. Actually, what happens is things become stranger. And so I believe the Bible's position and our position at Rooted is that that is a, a no, um, that, that, that the Bible does not give license and freedom to do so. Okay, so I just wanted to, to put that up front. But, but Stephen and I were chatting a little bit about this yesterday, just briefly. And you actually, you, you introduced a question before that, which I thought was super helpful. So, so it's like, I'm asking this question about adoption, about all these things. And you were like, man, yeah, yeah, there's yes, adoption, no artificial insemination. But you were like, but I think it's important that you ask a question before that about the heart and why, the why you'd want to. Do you want to, do you want to flesh that out a little bit? Mm, okay. Um, I can't remember exactly the discussion, but I think it may have been what was a sort of asking, are you wanting to force something? Are you wanting something too much, perhaps? Yes, and yes. That, that's, yeah. So, yeah, because I think this, this is at the heart of this whole discussion about singleness, marriage, and then even wanting to have kids is, is a very difficult discussion about like wanting something, making something good into an ultimate thing that, mm. I, that I really need to have. Mm. And, and so for me personally, um, when I was single and if I were single, I think where I would land is I would sort of say I can use my, my gift of singles in, dif in different ways mm. than, than to adopt. But um, I agree with you, it, it's not, it, it, someone else might feel like, no, I can use the, mm. the, the gifts and the, the time and the finances and, mm. and whatever I have, I can, I can serve the community and, and a child in that way. So I agree, it's, it's totally a, a, a good option potentially. Mm. But, but I, I think I think singleness and this whole discussion forces us to ask, like, to keep wrestling with our hearts and being like, do we want something too much? Mm. Are we are we overly desiring mm. something? And and how do we learn to be content and embrace the situation we're in? Because I think one Corinthians seven, which you read some extracts from, the big point there is about embracing the situation you're in mm. and not wanting to change it. Yeah. Um, and uh, like Paul does give license to to change. It's like you can change your status if, yeah. if that's what you choose. But it's almost like his encouragement is to embrace the situation you're in. Yeah. If you're married, stay married, embrace it. If you're single, it's, it's good to it's good to remain single. Yeah. That's yeah. what he that's what he says. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I sort of feel like it, it raises those sorts of questions about do you want yeah. something too much perhaps. It's good. That's really good. Yeah, I think it's 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 recognizing that uh, we all have desires and wants, uh, and, and many of those are good. Um, but when you want them over the Lord then there's an issue um, when you're essentially asking for someone to fill a hole that only God can fill. And what ends up happening is you're going to crush that other person, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a child, whether it's a friend, whether it's an employee, whatever it is, you're going to crush them because they cannot carry the weight that only God can carry. And so I think it's just a good evaluation question. The Bible says, examine your heart uh, and ask the question, what, 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 is, what, is, what is the motivation for this? Um, is it because I, I feel like it will fulfill me, that it will, uh, I'll find my identity in it? No, I can only be fulfilled by God and find my identity in Him. Um, and so those are just helpful questions. Again, to ask them in the context of community, yeah. to be vulnerable and transparent in community, to say, hey, I, I just want to talk about something. I have this massive desire. It's so consuming. I really, really want it. But I don't know. Can, can you help me process this? God will do some amazing things through that. And what he will bring to the surface, I'm telling you, it'll be absolutely amazing. Um, cool. Which, a few more questions. Um, what, what, can, 
What can the church do to cultivate a, a, a kind of culture where singleness is affirmed and not immediately viewed as negative? Um, and I ask this because uh, the world has idolized sex, right? And, and to a large extent, the church has jumped on that train as well. Um, and we talk about it in this way that we like, hey, you know, intimacy, God's all for intimacy. And, uh, and the best way to experience intimacy is in marriage when you're having sex. That's, you know, that, and it, it kind of leaves this, uh, this thought of, well, that's the only way that real deep intimacy can be experienced. And so that, does that mean as a single person that I, I can never, like there's an intimacy that you have, a deeper place that you go with God that I can never go to because I, I'm not married. Um, so maybe just, just some thoughts around that. Like, is, is there anything that we as the church can do? Because that's not true. Um, maybe let me say this. Yeah. It's not true. And the reason it's not true is because the Bible says it's not true. Okay? Yeah. So, so um, this, this idea of, of, of intimacy can also be experienced in friendships. Yeah. In godly, yeah. gospel-saturated friendships. It's not just in sex. It's like to make the like the intimacy that is experienced in sex is just another kind of intimacy, but intimacy can be experienced through friendships. And, and I think the church should do better. And I'm saying this as one who sits in the position of lead pastor here is to talk about that more and is to create those spaces where we can build really authentic, deep, vulnerable, transparent friendships. And, and we do that because the Bible says so. So we can go to James chapter two, verse twenty-three, uh, where James writes uh, that. We're friends of God. He's pointing us to Abraham, where Abraham was a friend of God. And I mean, there's a song that's come out of it, right? I am a friend. Of, yeah, there we go. He calls me friend. So, so, so we can go there, but, but it's not just in James. In fact, if you go to Job, so Job chapter 29, verse 4, um, go read verse 1 to 6. It's amazing. Um, but in verse 4, the word friendship comes up where, where Job is saying, man, I, I remember the days where uh, just my friendship, my friendship with God was so intimate. It was so good. He doesn't talk about his marriage. or no, He said, my, my friendship with God. And God wants us to have that kind of friendship with one another in the context of community. In fact, that word uh, friendship, the, the, uh, the Hebrew word for it is sod, uh, where it's meant to be understood like a couch. Anybody have a couch that you just love to sit on? where you, you're just so comfortable. It's almost like you sink into it and you feel so, feel so good and you feel so safe and you can rest in it. I mean, that, that's the level of intimacy that we should be able to have with one another and we should build. Um, so I'm just thinking through what, what are some of the ways in terms of, like as we talk about intimacy and, 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 and trying to move away from this thing of that can only be experienced in, in the context of marriage because you're having sex, then that means I'm left out uh, and so there's this negative view of it. Any thoughts around that? What can the church do? I feel like you didn't prepare us for this question. <laughs> but it's, it's um, no, no, but I mean, I think the, the root of thinking about it from a perspective of intimacy, and um, I think I, I just want to backtrack a bit with mm. that uh, subject because I can only imagine, right? Because obviously I'm not in the situation. Maybe you can add and see if I'm telling the truth or lying. But um, sitting, in, sitting there and hearing you know, you can, no, but you can, you can experience deep, deep intimacy and it does mm. not include, you know, sexual intimacy. And if you, you long for it and you want that, or, you know, you've heard or you've read, I mean, culture outside does not stop telling us about the amazing ways uh, and experiences of uh, sexual intimacy. And it's like the curiosity and, mm. no, but I want that. So you can tell me about all other sorts of deep intimacy mm. and all of those things, but I want to experience this particular one. It can, yeah, it can sound, I don't know, like it's a, it then brings up the, what, what um, Steven was saying, like it's like the discontentment of like, yeah, you kind of like making me want to settle for, for less. Mm. And um, which obviously we know is not true. Your head tells you the right thing and, uh, and you, your heart starts desiring other things because of what you're exposed to and what you're hearing. And so in a way the church she not only, it's not like a thing that we bring up once and talk about like, you know, that you can experience intimacy beyond mm. sexual intimacy. And I think, well, we're gonna talk about it in marriage, but it's like, I think there's people that can vouch, not just vouch, I think we can hear from the world, we can hear from our own, even relationships in marriage that, yes, that is a cherry on top, something that you experience and enjoy it, but ultimately that is not the thing mm. that keeps any relationship and any deep intimacy going on. Like, mm. it's not the thing that, really holds it together like um, um, like we can make it out to be you know so 
it, yes, yes, of course, sex is supposed to be marriage, and I'm not saying I'm not done playing it, but I'm saying it does not offer the thing that you might be sitting there as a single person thinking, but no, you are, you're selling me something short. Mm. There's something you're having and I'm not having, and I also want it. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah, just sympath empathize with that mm. and, uh, and say that is a legit thing to long for and wonder and ask and be like, but I want this thing. Yeah. Um, at the same time, also in the same angle, I just wanted to say, I think even when we talk of people who say they, not everyone, I'm not speaking for everyone, but this concept of I'm content in my singleness, that's a good thing. As long as it's not mirrored to when the world, and when I say the world, I'm talking about people who do not know God, who are not believers. When they say, I'm content in my singleness, mm -hmm. it's very different things. Yeah. Because in their yeah. singleness, they might still very much be having sex. And doing, the, actually, they, they'll do all the things that people in marriage will do. They'll have, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they'll do all those things. But you, you, you are not going to do that as a believer mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you are under a different law, yeah. a different obedience. Yeah. And so we can't mirror our hashtag I'm content the same as the world. Mm -hmm. Your singleness is very different from the singleness of the world. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah. Speaking on contentment, um, I, it's something that I've struggled with. And I think the struggle of being content about a thing is because it is the ultimate thing. Yeah. And, the way, and the way scripture encourages us, because we will always have unfulfilled desires mm. our whole lives, even after we get married or whatever, um, is that you already have the treasure. Like you have the ultimate treasure already. Mm. So I think, again, don't encourage people with lies. Like go to scripture. <laughs> yeah. That's a hashtag. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it, go for it. Yeah, because I, I was prepared for this question. Um, <laughs> the question of what the church... Wow. And it was, it was here. So, because <laughs> so, you asked what can the church do to also affirm yeah. singleness, and, and, and then we, we spoke a lot about intimacy as well. So, um, so, so Psalm 68 says a, a few amazing things about who God is and what he does. Um, it says he's the father to the fatherless, uh, the defender of widows. Mm. And it goes on to say that he places the lonely in families. Mm. And I thought that that is a beautiful thing that God does. I think ultimately it'll have fulfillment in the new creation when we will all be part of mm. uh, God's true family and experience full deep intimacy. Mm. But I think it has current application to an extent now in the church. Um, and if you look at the way the New Testament calls us to treat each other, it's as fathers and sisters and mothers and brothers and, and as, as true family. Um, so I think that, that firstly, uh, that the church does have, there are implications for this for how we, how we love each other mm. and how we, we need to be true family because many people are single. Mm. And also in many situations, we will counsel people to remain single mm. in some situations. Mm. And we can only do that if, we've, if we truly believe it's a viable, good way of life. Mm. We can't say to someone, I think in your situation, given what you're thinking, what you're desiring, what you're wanting, I think you should maybe remain single sure. for now or for a long time. Or maybe for, I don't think we can say that to people if we don't actually truly believe and model that singleness is a great way of living. So good. Sure. We can't do that because otherwise we're buying into the narrative that sex and romantic love is an ultimate thing. Mm -hmm. That unless you have it, you haven't truly lived. So good. We, we have to believe it. We have to believe that we'll get to the new creation. That if a single person stays a virgin through their whole life and gets to the new creation, that they will spend thousands and millions of years with no regrets. Never, and it's not because God will kind of somehow miraculously erase their memory and, and kind of like trick them into thinking they never missed out on something great they will truly know and believe yeah. that they didn't miss out on something yeah. that they really had to experience mm. in this world. Yeah. Sure. And, and so, so much comes down to this thing of do we, do we, how do we rightly value God's gifts? Mm. Because cause, cause we have to value, like sex is a good gift mm. and marriage is a great gift, mm. but we mustn't make it this ultimate thing that if you don't have it, uh, you've missed out, it's second rate. Um, we have to believe that. Mm. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's one part of it. The other part of what I think the church should do if we really want to affirm singleness, uh, there's other aspects to this. Um, I, think, uh, I think we need to also show single people um, that we expect them to lead. 
and to yeah. be, take responsibility and to serve and that we don't subtly buy into the narrative that yeah. only really when you're married do you, are you really spiritually mature mm. um, or because because and, and, and this is this is uh, this is a challenge to us as a church it's a challenge to married people mm. because we need to be quite intentional about having single leaders in different positions of authority. Mm. We need to be clear that single people can be in authority over married people mm. and not be like, no, you can't, you can't have a thought. Like that kind of stuff is, is really important. Mm. Um, and it's also very, cha not only for single people should this be affirming, it should be very affirming to mm. single people of, of the value and the worth mm. that we think they have and, and the role they need to play in our community. Mm. But it's also very challenging to them. The flip side of this is a challenge to single people. Um, maybe speaking especially to single guys, sometimes a tendency I've seen of not stepping up and taking responsibility, of sort of waiting till I'll deal with those issues, I'll deal with that sin, I will grow, I'll be mature, I'll take responsibility and lead mm. and not be passive only when I'm married. Mm. Like Paul, good, like Paul and Timothy, think of Paul, like Paul is speaking, Paul is a single, uh, leader in the church, speaking to Timothy as a younger, single, I think single, we're not 100% sure, mm -hmm. but I think uh, he seemed to be single uh, person leading in the church. Um, and he says, to, he says to Timothy, don't, look any, don't let anyone look down on you because of your age. Yeah. And I also want to add as well to single people, don't let anyone look down on you because of your singleness. Mm -hmm. it's, you're not less than, you're not less spiritually mature. Yeah. Um, you can lead and and so, yeah, it's both to the church, like let's, let's mm. let single people lead, single men and single women, and single people aspire to lead, aspire to, to take responsibility, to serve, to use your gifts, mm. um, and to not wait for one fine day when maybe one day you're married, you can, you can do the real things and you can live to the full. That's Thank a good you. word. Very good. Very good. Well, friends, man, we are, we are, we are, we are, we're pressed for time. So um, what I, what I want to do is maybe give, uh, if you want to, you don't have to, but maybe uh, folks here, one last word um, just on this, uh, anything that, um, that would come. I did have a question here, so if you want to weave it in there, and you kind of alluded a little bit to it, is uh, I guess the big one, we're not talking about dating, um, but if you're single, that is something that you can do, because uh, if you're married, you cannot date. <laughs> if, that's, if that's new to you, then, then, then we have bigger problems than you think. Um, so, but but as a single person you can date and so and so should I date and um, and and how should I date? Um, so it was the last one on there, but you can throw it in as your last comment, or you can say something else. Um, but I'm going to close this out, um, and the, the band will, will lead us. So any, again, you don't have to. You can be like, no, nah, I'm good. I got it all out. Um, I want to go back to the idolatry yeah. situation and just explain how I've spoken to other people about this. How unhelpful like idolizing marriage is and to say, like, I think it drives, we spoke about how marrying non-Christians becomes such a viable option. And I think the idolatry of marriage is what helps drive that. And of course, we are all accountable before God for mm. ourselves. But if you are making it like it is the ultimate thing for spirituality, then you aren't helping people who are trying to remain faithful to God. Mm. That's good, that's a good word. Last words. Oh, you want to go? Okay. Um, I think maybe, maybe touching on that last question a bit mm. is, um, I think we need to let our church space, our church our community, like be a safe space for people to be able to date. Mm. Um, I think if we see two people that we know having coffee, two single people that we know, can we not make a fuss over it? Mm. Can we not make them uncomfortable? Mm. Like, so that, because it becomes a thing where you're scared to even go on that date, because mm. then it's going to be assumed that, oh, since we've gone on a coffee, uh, now I need to now pursue this particular person. Even though the point of going to coffee is just getting to know one another. Mm. Um, and also just, even in doing that, obviously, be responsible about it. Like, don't go 10 coffees with 10 different guys mm. or girls. And <laughs> like, it's like we're worried. Like, you just can't focus. <laughs> And one person for a little bit. Um, this is where obviously <laughs> community plays in. Like you have brothers, you have sisters in the church. Like, hey, I want to take this person on a coffee. Okay, great, go, you know. Uh, and then it's like, what happened from it? Why do you think, why don't you want to go to the next one? Like have accountability for those decisions of those dates. But 
don't not go on those dates because of fear of what other people are going to say or think. And let's, let's just give one another that, that freedom to be able to, well, let's give single people the freedom to date and get to know one another Good. without yeah, that massive expectation and awkwardness that can sometimes come with it. It's very good. Yeah, I think I think those were those were good pieces of advice. I think maybe you may, conference mentioned earlier about um, single women feeling like they have to wait, and that's a particular struggle maybe for women and not taking the initiative in it. Maybe the flip side for guys is it's quite a risk. Uh, you you pursue someone and doesn't work out. It's 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 a risk. Um, and uh, yeah, and and it can be unhelpful when people read into every little thing like who you, you sat next to mm. this Sunday now suddenly. People, people are suspect uh, are, are talking about there might be something there, but again, maybe the flip side of not always kind of always trying to set people up because that can be uh, unhelpful when when you sort of constantly trying to set people up and make them feel like you should be moving towards this this destination. Sometimes people also do need a bit of a prompt and do appreciate yeah. the conversation. So I know that there were times where I would have like kind of I wasn't overly sensitive about being asked about singleness or thinking like that, like. Sometimes we're not too sensitive. Like, don't be too scared to 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 touch us. To ask us how we're doing in that area. I'm going to say that as my old as when I was as a single, speaking on behalf, speaking on behalf of, of singles. But you get what I'm saying. Like, I think you need to read the room because it's we shouldn't be scared of having conversations. Yeah. No, we shouldn't be like now we can't ever ask a single person how they're yeah. doing or whatever. Yeah. We do need to have that conversation just with a bit of tact, a bit of love, a bit of yeah. not wanting to push them into marriage, make them feel like they should get married. But also, if they are wanting to, if they are desiring marriage, to help them think through how, how yeah. to act, how, yeah. what can they do? It's good. Um, yeah, that's really good. Sorry, oh. I, can I just prompt Alyssa? Something she told me yesterday. Yeah. That whole, yeah. You remember? Oh, I. Well, everything. Oh. <laughs> I was actually thinking of something else. Oh, say the um, In terms of taking offense, because I think this conversation was largely about married people, but I also think, as a single person even when you're sinned against, even when you're offended, God is at least doing two things at that time. And one of those things is in you. Like when we are sinned against, God is also still doing a work in us. And the inclination is to be trying to solve the other person. And I think do that hard work with God as well, mm. is what I would say. I think uh, you should do the prayer for well. like, No, okay, I won't do it. Um, <clears throat> I think, not I think, so there's some things that I think even at the beginning when you spoke this morning is that there isn't like set things that are very clear on like how we date, da, da, da. you know, like there's some clear biblical ways it's like you can't do that. Like we all know that. Um, and oh, I think maybe, maybe they don't. Uh, I mean, I think not. I think you, you should not be living with uh, or sleeping or with that person. Like it's like those are things that you do when you're married. Uh, but what I wanted to focus on, though, is the whole thing of um. We all have like preferences and cultural way maybe of doing things. Um, some cultures are bent more into biblical way of doing things, others are not sometimes. So we also need to put that before the word mm. and then put them next to each other and say, even though culturally we do this, does the word of God affirm this? Mm. It's not just like, oh no, but we just do this. It's like, mm. no, you need, we need to apply ourselves. Uh, but what I want to say is that even in dating, it's like, you know, some people really strongly, and this is not a biblical, not biblical thing. It's like, I have to wait. The man has to absolutely, absolutely initiate. That is good. That is what is how you want it to be, how it is. But if you're a girl that is like, hey, I like this person and I want to initiate a coffee, I want to say up front that I don't think I'm against that. Uh, I would say you are my hashtag Ruth girls. Like, we can go sit at the feet of boys and like, like, hey, hint, hint, you need to do something now, you know. So I would be more on that camp. I am not, please do not judge me. I'm not judging you who is waiting. Don't judge me who's willing to sit at the feet of boys, which essentially is what happened for me to have treasure like this in my life. So. <laughs> I was like, that's a, that's a trailer, a trailer attraction to next week. Yeah, I was young, I didn't know what was going no. on. But I thank the Lord for the Ruth in my life. Come on. All right, that's a good word. Um, that's a really good word. Oh, well, let me, I'll, I'll close in this bank and come up. Um, but um, I think even on, just on the dating, but I think it goes beyond that. I think take responsibility for your spiritual formation. Yeah. Sure.
You know, like I, at the end of the day, it's like, just, just take responsibility. Um, I think too often we ask the question, and we should, but too often we be like, this person should be this, this person should be this, this person should be this. Stop. Who should you be? Yeah. Who's God called yeah. you to be? Yeah. Are you growing in the word? Are you growing in your prayer life? Are you sharing your faith? Mm. Can you remember the last time God did something massive in your life? What's your testimony? Sure. Not 20 years ago. That's a powerful testimony of how you came to faith. But what's your testimony of yesterday or last week? Yeah. God's molding and shaping me. And so take yeah. responsibility for your spiritual formation. And then watch God work. Whether he calls you to marriage or whether he calls you to singleness, watch him work. Yeah. All right. So, um, so can we give a, a round of applause to our folks? Um, thank you so much. Everyone, you guys can go grab your seat. I'll, I'll grab that. I'll grab that. Thank you so, so much. Um, nice, cool, don't stress. Um, look, how, how, do we, how do we respond to all of this? Well, we respond the same way we always respond every single Sunday. Um, we respond to the goodness of God. Uh, we respond to His faithfulness. We respond to His mercy and His grace. Um, uh, folks in here, you're walking through different journeys. You're at different places in your life. Um, there is so much difference in here. Uh, but God remains the same. Uh, he's the same God, the same God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, and because He's the same God, then His promises are still yes and amen in Jesus. And so we can respond to that. We can respond to the promises that are found in Jesus that are made available to those who've crossed the line of faith and who trust Him. And so whether you're single or you're married, you respond to Jesus the same in utter, complete surrender. And so I'm going to ask you to stand in a moment and we're going to sing and then we're going to go home and go do your thing. But, but as we sing, um, we just want to affirm God's promises that He has scattered throughout His Word that have been made available to us. And so will you lean into those? Whatever it is you're going through, would you lean into those? If you are in desperate need of forgiveness, then lean into the forgiveness that is found in Jesus. If, if you need to be content, then lean into the contentness that is found uh, in Jesus. If, if, if you need hope, then lean into the hope that is found in Jesus. Lean into His promises. And so Father, we thank You for Your mercy. We thank You for Your grace. Help us as we sing these words. May we sing them because we know that they are true. We sing to a Savior who has defeated sin, death, and Satan, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And He, he prays for us. Jesus, you pray for us. You pray for us. And whatever it is that we're going through, you pray for us by name and by circumstance. And so help us to lean in, into that. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.